So there are many, many ionic compounds. Much of the Earth's crust is actually composed of ionic compounds. We often call them minerals, right? Um, ionic compounds are also present in the food that we eat. <coughs> ionic compounds tend to be very stable because the ionic bonds that hold them together are very strong. And so it takes a lot of energy to cause, cause them to become something else. Um, here are a couple of examples. Here we've got um, Morton light salt. And what makes this light is not that it has fewer calories because salt doesn't have any calories, but it's lower in sodium. And the way they make it lower in sodium is it's a mixture of sodium chloride and potassium chloride. And so less sodium can have less effect on your blood pressure. Tums, an antacid, contains calcium carbonate, an ionic compound. And here are some examples of minerals. Um, here's an example of one of those atypical types of formulas. Here we have two different cations. That's not something we're going to learn about in this class. Potassium chloride um, has a somewhat similar taste, but it doesn't taste exactly the same. So we wouldn't want to use just potassium chloride because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be what we're looking for. The advantage of mixing potassium chloride in there instead of something else is one of the things that's important in your body is the balance of sodium ions and potassium ions. And so if your intake of sodium is too high or you're tending to have high blood pressure, um, getting more potassium can help with that issue. And so here you're getting the potassium with the sodium. So, we're going to learn how to write formulas for ionic compounds. We should always start with the symbol for each ion. We've got the metal cation and the non-metal anion. Ions have charges, and it's important to write the charge before you figure out how they go together. In the beginning, we need to write this out and do lots of steps on paper. And then as we become more proficient, we can kind of picture it in our heads and we don't actually have to write it out. But in the beginning, unless you're already a whiz at this, humor me and write it out. We're going to change the subscripts. We're gonna put these together in a way that the charges would add up to zero. Because we're looking for the lowest, the smallest unit that would be electrically neutral and then we want to check the charges, that the charges add up to zero. So ionic compounds always have positive and negative ions. You can't have two positives or two negatives. Electrical charges that are the same repel each other. We have to have opposite charges. The first element is usually a metal. There's only one exception to that that you need to remember. And that's, if it starts with NH4, NH4 is ammonium. It's the only polyatomic cation that we expect you to remember. And when we make chemical formulas, the sums of the charges have to add up to zero. Or you can say the sum of the positive charges must equal the sum of the negative charges. And the formula is always going to be the smallest whole number ratio. So let's do some examples. Pardon me? That's an ionic compound without a metal? Right. If it starts with NH4, and those are the only ones that I expect you to be able to identify. But that's not very common. Not very common, no. But it does show up, and it shows up in this class, which is why it's like, yeah, that's the one thing. Okay, so let's take what we learned there and write a formula for the compound formed between potassium and sulfur. So we have two different elements here. Potassium, what's the symbol for potassium? K. K. And is it a metal or a non-metal? It's a metal. Um, sulfur is S, and it's a non-metal. So we have a metal and a non-metal. In chemistry land, this is a guy and a girl. 
Um, and so we need to figure out what charge does the potassium ion have? Plus one. Plus one. And we know that because it's in group one. So we learned that the main group metals, group one plus one, group two plus two, group three plus three, right? So we'll indicate the charge here, plus one. And then sulfur, sulfur is a non-metal over here, and how do we figure out the charge on that? Count from the end. So at the end is argon, and we go back one is negative one to chlorine, back two to sulfur, so it's two negative. So two minus. So any questions about that? And remember, non-metals are negative. Mm, right? Okay, so that's the first step, the two ions with their charges. And now what we need to do is figure out how can we combine these, what number of each, so that we get a neutral compound. And there are several ways to think about this. Okay, Some of you can look at that and say, well, the least common multiple of 1 and 2 is 2, and so I just need 2 Ks and 1 S. What's the big deal? Oh, great, you're fine. You can just think about something else right now. Um, most of the rest of you are like, what the heck were you talking about? So I'm going to show you two other ways to think about this. So what I need is for the total charge on the positive ions to be equal to the total charge in the negative ions. So what I've got right now is I've got plus 1 and I've got minus 2. This needs to be equal but opposite in sign. These need to add up to zero. Is one minus two zero? No, of course it isn't. I need this to be plus two. Well, if I put another potassium ion in here, now it's plus two, right? Because I have two of them. Plus two and minus two add up to zero, right? So this combination here would be neutral. And so I'm gonna represent that as the cation first, and there's two of those, followed by the anion. There's one, I don't need to write the one. Any questions? We leave out the, we leave out the charges when we write the formula for the compound. Because, you know, I'm a person, I always, I always like to know why, and sometimes um, the actual reason is unknowable or would just take too much effort to know, so I make up my own reasons. So my reason for why don't we show those is it would be so messy. Now we've got stacked superscripts and subscripts and we've got all these signs and numbers all over the place and this isn't necessary if we want to know the charges we look at the periodic table we only are going to write things that are necessary so if that helps that's why we don't do that so that's one way anybody have any questions about that The other method um, we tend to refer to as crisscross. Um, students like this because you don't have to think very much. Um, and it works most of the time, but you do have to be a little bit careful with it. So what you're going to do here, you can use the crisscross method if these numbers are not the same. So here we have 1 and 2. They're not the same. So I'm going to take the number here, which is an unwritten one, and that's going to become the subscript for the other ion. And this two is going to become the subscript for this ion. And so I end up with K2O. The, no. S. I was looking at this circle. Yeah, K2S. Elements don't change. Any questions? Let's do another one. Aluminum and nitrogen. Well, what's the symbol for aluminum? 
A L. Metal or non metal? Metal. metal. What's the charge? Plus three. Plus three. Why? It's the main group and it's in group three A. So the charge here is three plus. And then nitrogen is N. What's the charge on nitrogen? Negative three. Negative three. So we write that as three minus. And after we have the formulas for the ions with their charges, then we can figure out how to put them together to make a neutral compound. So here I have plus three and minus three. The number is the same. I don't want a crisscross here because I'm not gonna get the lowest ratio. The numbers are the same. I just need to shove these two together and they're good, right? So A, L, N. And just a note about handwriting. Um, so when you're just writing words and sentences and stuff, if you want to use all caps or all lowercase or whatever, that's fine. When we're writing chemical formulas, we have to use capitals and lowercase letters correctly. And so aluminum is not a L. This is a capital L. I don't care if it's small. That's going to be confusing. It's not acceptable. Okay. N A, you know, lowercase, this must be a lowercase A. You can write the rest of things in all caps if you want, but not element symbols. Okay. Yes. This would be potassium sulfide and this would be aluminum nitride. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Any other questions? Naming ionic compounds. So glad you asked. Um, there are compounds that have common names. An example of that would be water. That's not the scientific name for, for that compound, but it's what everybody uses. There are lots of common names for different compounds. But we also have systematic names for different compounds. Um, so every compound has one correct systematic name. Now sometimes that systematic name is really long and complicated and so we call it something else. Like the pain reliever ibuprofen. Now, well Advil is, a, is the brand name but we call the actual active ingredient ibuprofen. That's not the scientific name for that compound. But it's easy. It's a common name because the actual scientific name is really, really long, but it does exist. So we're gonna learn systematic names for different compounds. Each type of compound has a different set of naming rules. And you might think, well, why? Um, because the different rules work well for their compounds. This is a little bit like humans um, humans in different cultures have different ways of naming their children, right? So my ancestors all came from Sweden. And back in the old days, the son, for his last name, would take his father's name with, with son at the end. So if your dad's name was John and you're a guy, then your last name is Johnson. If your dad's name was Anders, then you are so-and-so Anderson. That's why they're all sons. Yeah, Carlson, Johansson, all of that. What if your name was Carlson? Would it be Carlson's son? Well, your last name would be Carlson, but you'd have a first name. Oh. Yeah. So if you were Peter Carlson, then your son, his last name would be Peterson. So in a way, you know, it's really helpful because it tells who your dad is. But then in another way, you try to go into genealogy research and stuff, and the last names change every generation. Like, ah, becomes very confusing. And then what about the women? Because I'm not the son of Carl, right? They use daughter, D-O-T-T-E-R. And so if your dad's name was John, and you were a girl, your last name is John's daughter, Andrew's daughter. And then when you got married, you took your husband's name, but you know, that's a pattern. That's not the pattern that we use in the United States. There are Asian countries and other countries where people just have a single name. 
That's just how they do it. It works for them. There are other places where your family name is first and your individual name is second, right? Different systems, right? So you go to that culture and you're, you accept that this is how they name their children. So it's, it's like that for these different classes of compounds. So ionic compounds have a different pattern of naming than molecular compounds, okay? So the first thing to do is to figure out what kind of compound am I dealing with? You know, is this a person from Sweden back in the old days? Is this a person from Japan or, you know, from the United States? What system of naming is being used here? So we have to identify ionic versus molecular. We've already talked about that a little bit. But this is helpful to remember. Ionic compounds are usually composed of metals and nonmetals. So we can just look at the first element and ask ourselves, well, is that a metal? Is sodium a metal? Yeah, it is. And if we're not sure, we find it in the periodic table. If it's to the left of the stair-step line, it's a metal. All of these, aluminum, calcium, magnesium. Yes? Is it going to be up in a test? Pardon me? Is it going to be up in a test? Oh, yes. Yeah, that periodic table's not going anywhere. And I'll also give you a periodic table that you can look at so you don't have to, you know, strain your neck or anything, or if your eyesight isn't very good. Um, and it has the line on it as well. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Does uh, so you said all the all the on the left side are men, right? Does the alkaline or metal and those those do those do make any difference while looking for the compounds? So the difference, like the alkaline earths versus the alkaline metals, the difference will be in what charge they have, but they're still going to make ionic compounds. Yeah. Okay, so all of these start with a metal, they're all ionic compounds. That's the first, first step. And we can break these into two types depending on the kind of metal. Some metals only form one kind of ion. And those are the ones we've talked about already, the main group elements, group 1A, 2A, 3A. Calcium is in group 2A. Calcium ions are always 2 plus. It's very nice, right? There are other metals the transition metals that are, I think of them as being squirrely, right? They form different kinds of ions. Iron could be plus three or plus two, and you can't tell by looking at the periodic table. So it's kind of a pain that way. So we have metals that form only one kind of ion and metals that form more than one kind. So the metals that form one ion are Group 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc and silver. Um, scandium is also in there, but scandium shows up so infrequently that I don't see the point in memorizing it. Groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc and Oops, silver. So my goal today is to chant that enough times that you can't forget it. Groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, and silver. So how do we know the charge on zinc and silver? Well, we know the charge on aluminum because it's in group 3A. It's 3 plus. And then I think of going down the stairs. 3, 2, 1. So this is 3 plus, 2 plus, 1 plus. Why? Because it is. That's just, that's just it. So these guys that are nice and predictable, the name of the ion is the same as the name of the element. So a silver ion is just a silver ion. You don't have to do anything. We don't have to indicate what the charge is or anything special because we know that silver is always plus one. This ion would be potassium ion. Its charge is predictable, it's K plus, okay? Then those other guys. So for our purposes, if it's not in groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc or silver, we're going to assume that it can form more than one ion. And then in the name, we have to specify which ion are we talking about. So I mentioned iron, 
Here's iron. Iron commonly forms plus three or, oh, that's a two, plus two or plus three ions. And so they need individual names so that we can tell them apart. This is an older system of naming with us and ik, and so this was ferrous and ferric, cobaltus and cobaltic. And I personally have a hard time remembering which is which, is which, which was more and which was less charge. And so if I see this and I need the charge, I'm actually just gonna go look it up. These older names exist. If they show up in homework or something, just go to a chart like this and look up what the charge is. You don't memorize those. It's an old fashioned. We not need to know it exists. Like they used to have a lot of toothpaste commercials. This toothpaste contains stannous fluoride. What's stannous? Stannous is tin. They like to use stannous fluoride instead of tin 2 fluoride because people don't like the idea of there being tin in their toothpaste, right? That doesn't sound good. Stannous sounds fancier. So the names we're going to use, you take the element name and then we use Roman numerals and put the charge in Roman numerals. So again, this is a little bit like a naming system, say like the Kings of England, right? There was Henry the second and Henry the third and Henry the fourth and Henry the fifth, right? Why do we need the Roman numeral? Because they had the same first name, right? They had the same name and so to distinguish them from each other, we need a Roman numeral. So Roman numerals are only used with metals. When was the last time you met someone named Susan the fourth? Right? It doesn't happen, right? It just doesn't happen with women. So these are metals, and you just indicate the name with Roman numerals in parentheses afterwards. Okay? Any questions? So this slide is a summary of my tricks. So metals in group 1A and 2A form ions with that charge. Um, metals in this triangle are also predictable. The other metal ions need Roman numerals. So this is what it comes down to. Groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, and silver do not use a Roman numeral. If it's not one of those, use a Roman numeral, okay? So those are the cations. What about the anions? Well, I think of anions as being, um, the nonmetals as being feminine. And so this works out well with my analogy too because traditionally when a woman gets married, she changes her last name, right? So when a non-metal becomes an ion, it changes the ending of its name. So fluorine becomes fluoride, chlorine becomes chloride. And so if you want to, you can think of forming an ionic compound as a guy and a girl getting married, right? If you don't want to think of it that way, that's fine too. So we just change the ending. We don't have to use Roman numerals or anything to specify the charges because all of these charges we can figure out from the periodic table, right? Count backward from the noble gases. Um, so your book makes a, a deal about binary ionic, ionic compounds versus the other kind. Um, I'm not really big into their name divisions, but here we have a metal and a nonmetal. So binary is two. Two ions. The name of the cation followed by the name of the anion. The name of the anion is the base name of that element with the ending changed to I. There's a space between the two names, just like you put a space between your first name and your last name. These are not proper nouns, though, so they are not capitalized. So KCl, K is a metal, it's potassium. So the first word in this name is potassium. Chlorine is a nonmetal. It changes the ending of its name. 
to chloride, and so this is potassium chloride. CaO, two elements, calcium and oxygen. Calcium is just calcium, because it's in group 2A. This was in group 1A. Group 1A, 2A, 3 is zinc or silver, no Roman numerals. Ca, and then O. O is oxygen, changes the ending of its name, oxide, calcium oxide. Yes? I'm sorry, but on the previous slide where you had the Roman numerals with plus 2 and plus 4, how do we determine whether it's plus 2 or plus 4? That's a good question. So when we're looking at names of these compounds, the Roman numeral in the name tells us what the charge is. If we're looking at the formula, we have to figure out what the charge is from the charge on the other ion. Yeah, and we'll practice we that. Yeah, we'll practice that. Anybody else have questions? So here we are naming compounds containing a metal that forms only one type of ion, cation. So we're asked to name this compound AG3N. And you know we could be cute and say, well, I want to name it Steve. But that's not going to be right on Master in Chemistry. So I look at the first element. It's a metal. What is the name of that metal? Silver. And then I'm going to ask myself, is that in group 1A, 2A, 3A zinc or silver? <laughs> well, yeah, it's silver. No Roman numeral. And then I'm going to look at the other element, nitrogen, and it changes the ending of its name and becomes nitride. So this is silver nitride. There's nothing in this name that pertains to the three here. We don't need to specify that because from silver nitride, we would say, well, silver is AG, and silver, we've got aluminum, zinc, silver, three, two, one. Silver is always plus one. And nitrogen, from its position on the periodic table, we know is three minus. And so we can write the formula and we'll come up with this formula. So we're trying to be concise here and not write a lot of extra stuff. Let's write the formula for rubidium sulfide. This is going the other way. Rubidium has the symbol RB. And from its position on the periodic table, what's the charge on it? Plus one. Sulfur, I've done this one this morning. Sulfur is S and it's 2 minus. Write the formulas for the ions with their charges first and then figure out how to put them together. So what is the formula? RB2S. Going from here to here, um, the math is actually very simple, and if I gave it to you in terms of, well, you know, children and cookies and sharing cookies or something, you'd have no problem with it at all. But when you look at it like this, sometimes you freak out. So this is a little bit like walking on a sidewalk. So we probably all walked on a sidewalk when we came into class somewhere on our journey, right? Were you worried about falling off the sidewalk? Probably didn't even think of it. You just walk on the sidewalk. Do you ever just spontaneously fall off the sidewalk? I can be klutzy sometimes, but I don't do that. What if that sidewalk was across the Grand Canyon and there were no rails? Would you just stroll across? No, you'd freak out, right? Why? Well, the consequences, right? And you just get all nervous and now I can't even walk on the sidewalk. That's what happens to some people when they look at something like this and try to figure this out. It's not that it's hard, it's that you've just like frozen, right? So if you're having trouble with stuff like this, please come and talk to me. And we'll, we'll use models or pictures. I've got lots of different ways I can explain it. 
once I explain it so that it clicks in your head, you'll say, oh, that's so easy. Yep, just like walking down the sidewalk. And then you'll be good to go, okay? But a lot of students struggle with this and they just struggle with it all semester long and it makes everything hard. So if you need help, ask for help, okay? <laughs> so when we have ionic compounds where the ion can form more than one kind of ion, then we include the Roman numerals for the charge, so it's the charge on the ion in Roman numerals, those go in parentheses, and then the base name of the nonmetal. We figure out the charge on the metal by inference, looking at the sums of the charges of the other ions. So as an example, CrBr3. So I'm supposed to name this. Well, what's the name for the element with the symbol Cr? It's chromium. And then I'm going to ask myself, is chromium in group 1, A2, A3, A, zinc, or silver? No, it isn't. What does that tell me? Needs a Roman numeral. So I'm going to write the parentheses and leave space for the Roman numeral, and I'm going to worry about that later. And then Br, bromide. Oops. Bromide. The only time you capitalize the name of a compound is when it's starting a sentence. And then it would just be the first, first word. So in order to figure out the charge on the chromium ion, I have to look at the anions. So I've got chromium with question mark. I don't know what its charge is. There is one of those chromium ions. Like there's no subscript after it. That means there's only one. And there's three bromide ions. So I'm going to draw three bromide ions. They each have a negative one charge, right? So what's the total negative charge on those three bromide ions? Negative three, right? And what has to be true about the total positive charge then? It has to be plus three. So this has to be plus three. That positive three charge is divided among, oh, there's only one. This one ion has to have the positive three charge. So then this is chromium three. So I can replace this with a three. So that's how we figure out the charges on those other ions. Any questions? Name this one, FES. Oh, the first element is iron. And what do we ask ourselves? Is that in groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc, or silver? No, it isn't. Roman numerals. And S is sulfur, which is sulfide in a compound name. This compound has one iron ion for every one sulfide ion. The charge on the sulfide ion is 2 minus from its position on the periodic table. If there's one of these for every one of those and it's neutral, what's the charge on the iron? Plus 2. So this must be iron 2 plus. So iron 2. Any questions? Write the formula for ruthenium IV oxide. What does IV mean? Four. Because V is five, and this is one before five. Four. And be thankful that we don't have to do math with Roman numerals. So ruthenium, what's the symbol? It's RU. Are you sure? Um, anytime you're doing these, try to remember what the symbol is first, and then, unless you're super sure, 
double check. So ruthenium four, what does that I be tell me, what does that tell me? That's the charge. So this is ruthenium with a four plus charge. That seems a little high. That's what it is. Oxide is oxygen, and what's the charge on oxygen? Two minus. So then how do we put these together so that we have a neutral compound? We could do, well, wait. Um, if we have RU4O2, that's not going to work, right? Because if we have four of these, it's going to be 16, and two of those would be four. RuO2 will do it. Now, if you crisscross this and you're not careful, you're going to end up with Ru2O4. And while technically that describes the compound, this is not the lowest ratio. We want the smallest unit that's electrically neutral. So we would have to simplify the ratio 2 to 4 to 1 to 2. The other way to do this is by, you know, just kind of drawing pictures. Um, you say, well, here I've got plus four and I've got minus two. This one's too small. All you can do is add more ions. You can't change their charges or subtract ions. So I need more negative ions. I could add another one, making this negative four. And now these are going to add up to zero. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so those were binary two, two elements. Polyatomic, we've got more than two. Um, so the naming pattern is the same. You name the cation, you name the anion. The difference is that the polyatomic anions have special names that we memorize. And I already told you which ones you had to memorize. So if we look at NaNO2, um, sometimes students are wanting to turn this into three things and say, well, sodium nitrogen oxide. Well, no, it isn't. Two ions, okay? So the sodium is one ion and everything else is another ion together. So we've got the Na and we've got the NO2. Um, we could put charges on these, sodium because it's in group one. The NO2, we could come up with the negative because we see that there's one of each or because we memorized it. This is sodium, this is nitrite because we said so, okay? And so you just put those two names together, there's the name of the compound. Naming the compound is easy, it's remembering the names of the polyatomic ions that's a little more challenging. So here are some common ones. What you'll notice is that most of these have an element, a nonmetal with some oxygens and a negative charge. And nitrite, nitrate, the, the beginning of this name is from nitrogen, and then it ends in eight or ite. Um, these with the oxygens are called oxy anions because they're anions that contain oxygen. And then there are some that are just a little bit weird, like hydroxide is OH minus, just because it is. And there's our little exceptional friend. NH4, the only positive polyatomic ion on the list. So most of those polyatomic ions are oxyanions, and um, they form series, like kind of like families, where the number of oxygen atoms is different. The charge is the same. The first element is the same. And so there's a pattern to these names that's why we get nitrite and nitrate. 
Nitrite has three oxygens. Nitrite has two oxygens. The charge is the same. The number of nitrogens is the same. It's just the number of oxygens that changes. Oops. So what if there's more than two? Well, then we use a prefix per, as in hyper, meaning more, and hypo, meaning less or below. A hypodermic needle goes below your dermis, be below your skin, right? So here's chlor eight, and this is the one you should just memorize. So you memorize this guy, and then we learn the pattern and we can figure out the others from the chlorate. So here's chlorate with an extra oxygen, it's perchlorate, like a hyperactive person has extra energy, right? Chlorite is the light version of chlorate. It's got a third fewer calories than regular Bud Light. Oh wait, um, a third fewer oxygens than regular chlorate, ClO2. And then one below chlorite is hypochlorite. So we're just adding or subtracting oxygens. Chlorine and bromine are in the same family on the periodic table. They're nonmetals, and so I think of them as being sisters. Right? So the one sister, chlorine, combines with oxygen and makes chlorate like this. Her sister, bromine, does the same thing. It's BrO3 minus. The number of oxygens is the same, the charge is the same. The name is different because this is bromine, but it's bromate. And this is perbromate with an extra oxygen, bromite with one less, and hypobromite with yet again one less. So you memorize the eights and make the others based on the pattern. So here that is written out. You can write this down. You could go on to Canvas and look at the PowerPoint slides and get a, a really nice screenshot of this so that you can have the picture on your camera, you know, I mean, on your phone to look at whenever you want to. Um, you memorize the eights, you memorize the pattern, and there you go. And just as a note, as the book explains it, they have it upside down. It's, it's still correct, but I think of more as being on top and less as being on the bottom. And so that's why I show it this way. Any questions? Okay, so let's name this guy. SNCLO32. So here we've got some parentheses without Roman numerals in them. What is up with that? And there's a number inside and outside the parentheses. So, well, let's ignore those parentheses for a minute and try to figure out what are the, there has to be two ions, just two. So draw a line here if it helps. One of the ions is SN and the other ion is the other stuff. ClO3. The parentheses here with the two on the outside are telling me that I have two of those units. This is like a bundle pack at Costco. You wanted to buy one bottle of ketchup, but you have to buy two. Or you have to buy it bundled with mayonnaise and pickle relish and mustard. You know, it's four pack, right? And how do they keep those together? Shrink wrap, or those pesky little plastic things. I like the shrimp, shrink wrap better. I think of these parentheses as like the shrink wrap. This polyatomic ion is a bundle. You can have one of them, or two of them, or three of them. You can't have one and a half. You can't just take part of it. It's the whole thing together. The parentheses are here because if we just wrote a two, I said, well, ClO3, and I've got two of them. That could get confusing, right? Do I mean two of these ions, ClO3, or do I mean one chlorine and 32 oxygens, right? So to avoid that confusion, when we have more than one of a polyatomic ion, 
we put parentheses around the polyatomic ion and how many on the outside. So here we've got our two ions. Well, tin. Is tin in group 1A, 2A, 3A zinc or silver? No, it isn't. So tin needs a Roman numeral. And then this one, what's the name of that? Chlorate. You can continue to review the memorization quiz questions on Canvas. And as you do problems like this, don't just look it up first. Try to remember what it is, then look it up to check. Okay, so this is chlorate. What's the charge on chlorate? Negative one. So this is chlorine, chlorate minus one. And we see that there are two of those. ClO3 minus. So I've got two of these to one of those. What's the charge on the tin? Plus two. So Roman numeral two. This is two plus. And that's how we figure it out. We look at how many anions, how many cations, and the charges, and figure it out, okay? Write the formula for cobalt 2 phosphate. Now, what's the formula for cobalt 2 ion? CO2 plus. It's important that that O be small, because otherwise it looks like carbon monoxide. Phosphate. PO4, 3 minus. Most of these polyatomic ions, especially the ones that end in eight or eight, they're this element at the beginning, phos, phosphorus, and some oxygens and a negative charge. And like on an exam, if you're not sure, take a guess, right? Phosphate. So if I want these to get together and be neutral, what do I need? I need three cobalts and two phosphates. So I have two of those polyatomic ions, so I need to put them in bracket, uh, parentheses. Because if I have two of these, I have a total of minus six and I'll squeeze another one in here. If I have three cobalt twos, then I also have a plus six. Any questions? Hydrated compounds. These will come up a little bit in this class. Hydrate is an ionic compound that has water associated in its crystal structure. It is a compound because it's a fixed number of water molecules. It's not just that it's wet. So cobalt 2 chloride, COCl2, if it has six water molecules with it, it's this pretty pinkish red color. And if it doesn't have water, it's this purple lavender color. This has water, and so it's called the hydrate, because when you're hydrated, that means you've been drinking enough water, right? And this isn't the dehydrate, it's the anhydrate. It's anhydrous, without water. So with the formulas, what we do is there's a dot here, and that dot does not mean multiplication. It's just a dot, okay? It's a dot, seven H2Os. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take the seven and use a numerical prefix, and then the word hydrate. So this is magnesium sulfate, and the prefix for seven is hepta, heptahydrate. Um, this guy right here, COCl2 is cobalt 2 chloride, hexahydrate. So these are the common prefixes. Right down here, 
and many of them should be familiar to you. You know, a triangle has how many sides? Tri means three. The pentagon has five sides, etc. Tetra. Again, that game Tetris. In the game Tetris, you've got things falling, and the things that are falling are four squares put together. Maybe you didn't notice that. The squares have four sides, and there's four of them. It's all based on four. Deca, like decade. So we need to know these prefixes. Most of them you already know. And hemi means half. So let's just practice a little bit naming these guys. What would we call this? Calcium sulfate. Because when we look at calcium, we ask ourselves, group 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc or silver? Group 2A, we don't need the Roman numeral. So calcium sulfate, and then the prefix for half is hemi, hemihydrate. How about this one, BACL2.6H2O. Barium chloride, and six is hexa. Hexa and six are the only ones that have X. Hexa hydrate. Let's practice going the other way. Copper two sulfate pentahydrate. Well, what's the ion co copper two? Cu with what charge? Two plus. And what's the formula for sulfate? SO4, two minus. So we've got plus two and minus two, so we don't need to do anything fancy. It's just gonna be Cu, SO4. And then we put a dot. Penta is five. It's dot five H2O. Questions?